Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, uh, Raymond and Mariska, for the invitation to give this presentation. Does it work? Yeah, okay, great. Um, I would like to show you today uh, something about a phenotype database and how we use the phenotype database to store nutritional studies. Uh, nutritional studies have a bit of a different, um, well, uh, needs, have different needs than general, generally than medical studies. And that's because generally the effect of, um, of food and nutrition is much smaller than for medica medications. So that's why in general we need a lot of measurements. Generally, a food has distinct effects on different processes. So we often are measuring a lot of processes, a lot of mo molecules. We have seasonal effects. You can imagine that people eat other things in, uh, in summer than in winters. But also, for instance, there is an effect of vi vitamin D production in summer. So the uh, amount of vitamin D in the, in the food can be lower. So that's why we need uh, a special type of design in nutrition, and that's the crossover design where um, the, the treatment is swapped. So first the first group first get a placebo, and then the treatment and vice versa. So for these reasons, we need uh, data integration. And that's why uh, the nutritional um, 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 community started development of the phenotype database. And this um, has uh, landed in the joint programming initiative in Empadasi, which I will come back to later. So you can find information on the phenotype database on www.dbmp.org. Uh, and it was an initiative by NUGO, the nu uh, Nutrigenomics uh, Organization, the Netherlands Metabolomics Center, and the Netherlands Bioinformatics Center. And the nutritional instance of this uh, uh, database can be found on studiesdbmp.org. The general idea is that there is a core part of the, of the application that stores the study design. The idea is that the study design will not change that much. The needs of how to store the data will not change over time so much as for the measurement part. You can imagine that uh, for measurements, every, well, five years new techniques are developed. So for instance, for transcriptomics, five years ago, most people were still using microarrays. Nowadays, most people are uh, using high throughput sequencing, and that requires other, has other, gives other needs to the system. So that's why we have this modular um, way uh, of development. So there is the core part that describes the study design, the study metadata, and there are different modules for the different types of measurements. And then there is an, um, another module where you can integrate the study data. Um, so this is the first um, page of the study wizard where you can uh, introduce a new study. And I'm now showing you the second version of the system. Mariska will show the, the first version, so that's why you will see another, uh, some other, uh, another look. The wizard um, uh, consists of different steps. So you first introduce general information on the study, information about the subject, about the design, and so on. On all those parts of the wizard, you can use templates. And that's, that makes it possible to really adjust the database to the type of information you want to store. You can imagine that if you want to store information about mice, other fields are needed than for humans. So that's why we will have another template for humans than for mice. And this is an example of a, a template for the design part. So for instance, we have diet interventions. And there, there is at least one field. The name of the intervention is always present in whatever template you have on the design. Then you have these fields that are specific for this specific template. So for instance, if I have a diet intervention, I would like to know the carbohydrate levels of my diet. Then there are other fields that are used in other templates. So for instance, we have sometimes also compound interventions, like for instance, giving people glucose. So these fields are present in the compound intervention template. And by having those available, you can reuse them in, in other templates. Um, if you would like to add a new field, there are all kinds of different types of fields. So you have text fields. For instance, you can also introduce a drop-down drop selection of terms. And we use this to create new vocabularies. In nutrition, we really lack a lot of uh, vocabularies uh, on different levels, especially on the description of study designs. And then there are numerical fields. 
but there are also other t fields like, for instance, terms from ontologies. So if you want to use a, a, um, an existing ontology, you can link out from the database to buy a portal, and a lot of ontologies are available there. So as I said, we often have um, crossover designs in nutrition, and here you can see an example of a crossover design of a study. So there are four groups here, and this is the way to introduce a study design in the system. So there is a timeline here on the uh, x-axis, and here there, here there are groups. And you just start describing when there is a placebo treatment and, a, um, and an anti-inflammatory mixed treatment. You just describe the type of treatment and just drag and drop it in the timeline. So it's also the way most people that are, um, uh, are uh, well, describing a study, they would generally are describing it such a way they just start drawing a um, a timeline and putting boxes on there. Um, of course, putting data in there is nice, but it's more, even more, more nice to get it out and to combine them. Um, so um, we have um, access, um, computer access to the system, especially for data integration. It's better um, to do the integration in um, statistical packages like, for instance, in R. Um, and we have um, ways to look at the data within the application, but those are mainly focused on simple um, analysis or especially visualization, so simple plots. You can search in application, so search for spe uh, specific studies. You can export your data to Excel, and as I said, you can have some visualization uh, possibilities. Well, um, to give you a bit of an idea about the system, the code, it's an open access um, an, an open source um, uh, system uh, under the Apache license. So anybody can use the, the code, reuse it, adjust it for whatever they like to do uh, with it. The, um, the system is secured with an uh, authentication authorization that is developed um, as part as the, of the Grails framework and is sustained by VMware. So I think it's good to, to note because, well, the authentication authorization is, of course, very essential for the safety of your data, and it's not something that has to be maintained by, by the foundation. It's uh, by the Phenotype Foundation. Well, about the data licensing. Um, as I said, we have this nutritional instance studies.dbmp.org. You can use it. You can also install the code on your own server if you like. This instance is on a server at TNO. It's behind our firewalls. It's daily backed up on other servers. It can only be uh, accessed by three administrators. Um, the data can be accessed only by the data owner and the data manager. As, uh, so uh, as soon as you introduce data, those are the only people who can access this. And if you like to give other people access, you can decide for it. So you can either give access to groups of people, to specific sp people, or make it open access. And that can be done under the Creative Commons license, but that's only on request. To give you a bit of an idea what we are doing with the system, in nutrition we are often using challenge tests because, as I said, the, the effects are generally quite small. And changes, um, adjustments to adaptations are generally bigger. So that's why we often use challenge tests, for instance, like the oral glucose tolerance test. Um, clinically, there are specific pre-diabetic subgroups described. So people are not yet officially sick, but they're in the, uh, they are becoming sick. So they're, um, they're ha um, having an impaired glucose, uh, glucose tolerance or a fasting glucose tolerance. And this is the, the area that is um, important and um, um, it's the area where nutritionists would like to interact and to, to um, uh, improve health. But the problem is that, as I said, we need a lot of data. We need a lot of um, um, measurements. And that's often not just available in one study. Well, we now have in our system something like 15 studies with oral glucose tolerance tests, as you can see here. And now we can start uh, asking questions by integrating different studies. So here is an example of three studies where all five pre-diabetic subgroups are available. So here you see the three studies with the five different subgroups. 
another question was, can we find um, health-related differences in response to this oral glucose tolerance test if we integrate uh, these three studies that we could not find by just using one study? Well, in fact, for instance, you can see here that um, compared to healthy, you can um, uh, distinct the diabetes and pre-diabetic uh, groups um, uh, by a linear mixed model with all kinds of measurements. And you can also here um, fi um, find the difference at time point 120, which is the time point which is known to be a very important time point in the oral glucose storage test. So this is just a very simple example to show you that you're actually, uh, it's possible to put together three different studies from totally different um, um, uh, groups um, at different locations and still find the um, logical differences between the groups. Well, what do we want to do at the end? Uh, as I indicated at the, in the beginning, this um, is now further developed also within the Empadasi project. And what they would like to do is um, to integrate all kinds of databases available in nutrition. It doesn't matter what, how, and um, um, who is using it, as long as they use the same wording and grammar. And these will be described as a fair concept. Uh, data should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So if uh, the systems all adhere to those standards, then we will have a federated database. So we will have a data sharing and nutrition system, and we can start querying and analyzing data from whatever system available uh, in the world. That's it, and then I would like to give over to Mariska. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, so, well, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Yodo has shown you uh, the phenotype database, how it is used in nutritional studies, and shown a really good example of how the phenotype database can help to answer research questions in that field. And now I would like to shift to the focus that we adopted in trade. We adopted the phenotype database as a tool to store non-high throughput molecular profiling assay data. Uh, so, you might be aware of TRADE, we have different word packages. We have a uh, sustainable solution of data management for the clinical domain, imaging, biobank, and the experimental domain. Now, I'm prim primarily in the experimental data domain, of which you again have different uh, packages, like you have proteomics, you have NGS, you have microarrays, and then the non high throughput uh, profiling. What these all have in common is the researcher starts with a sample, which already contains some metadata, like what is a sample? Uh, for instance, it is liver from a metastasis of a colorectal cancer. Uh, so that's the metadata. Then the researcher collects this data, does an experiment on it, does some treatments on it, and then they get raw data. But how they did the experiment and what are the conditions is again described in the metadata. And then next follows the analysis, making cutoffs or just processing the data. And then eventually they have processed data that they want to publish. And the metadata uh, is also available on how they did it, usually locally. And the processed data uh, is then now supposed to go to Transmart, to the data integration platform. As I said, the process data and the metadata is usually shared locally, but in trade we want to have the metadata become available for search, well, but by, by everyone that collaborates and people that uh, request it. So it is desired that the results become centrally available with traceable metadata so that people can repeat the experiments. Uh, it has come about earlier in the presentations, ontology, semantics, how do you name some things? Uh, I saw a lovely talk this morning from Pfizer that they have uh, looked at, oh, how, how is the data format supposed to be if you want to have it end up in Transmart? So it's really important that data formats that you use for storing the clinical data, the experimental data, is the same so that you have 
an easier integration in the data platform, but that you can also search for it easily in the tools that house the data. <coughs> so I just mentioned we have four experimental domains and traits that we see. And for each of these domains, we have chosen a tool. If you have NGS data, then you can look and run uh, you, you can look at pipelines and run the pipelines to get from the fast you file that you have from an experiment to the processed file that tells you over expression of a certain gene. So this can be found in Galaxy. For the microarrays, there is a tool called Chipster, really user-friendly. You can analyze your data in this manner and you can give the session to other people and then they see what you did. For the proteomics, uh, Columns tool is the one that will house the data and the focus of this talk is, of course, uh, for the non-high throughput or the non-omics experiments that will be housed in the Phenotab database. Now, this one is slightly different in that they're usually really simple experiments, easy to pipette, then easy to analyze. You analyze in Excel or in SPSS, uh, that, that's really simple. And then the scoring, like, okay, present, yes or no, intensity levels, uh, mutation, yes or no, CT values, uh, goes to the tool. So this is the old, uh, well, I say the old version. This is the tool currently provided by trade in the production environment. Uh, we will soon also switch to the newer version that Yilda showed. Uh, so some of you are aware that there is a trade cell and use case uh, that is available for sharing, and uh, you can import the data easily to Transmart. This data contains, uh, well, this data set contains high throughput data, but also non-omics data. And as the cell and use case was used to explore data formats and also the functionality of the Transmart tool, the non-omics data of this set was used to examine how, how can it help us in trade for the translational research. So cell and use case data is available here. Now we have tools in trade to store uh, the clinical variables. So these are just some clinical cor well, characteristics of the cell lines. But for studies, you don't need them. You can basically just have the subject identifier, the species, and the sample identifier. That's all you would need because the data goes to the data platform. Uh, so extensive description is not recommended. Uh, however, especially in the next tool, it's really nice that you can do some quick visualizations. So users do have the option to enter data like uh, gender, age, or tumor stage for the intuitive box plots. So uh, in trade, we want to use it for the different markers. So uh, what you can see here are some uh, items that were measured on cell and use case data. And behind it, you can see the type of uh, experiment, mRNA expression, mutation, uh, MLPA for the copy number determination, uh, and on which cell line this occurred. Th this is just one of the first sequence, uh, sequestering steps. Uh, within an mRNA expression, uh, you have features that are available uh, in the tool. Yilda just showed you how you make a template. The same you can do for uh, markers that you want to test. So, for instance, for the gene ARCA, you can have three different versions. Uh, CT value is what you measure on uh, the instrument. If you have a standard curve, you have a quantity, and then eventually you analyze it, you have a CT ratio. And you can see it is done by using a template for real-time experiments using CyberGreen. Now, what is really nice is that you can actually go inside these templates and then see, like, okay, uh, this is the gene, these are the primers that are used, just basically all the information that you as a user would need to reproduce the results or redo your experiments. And uh, again, this is common sense in most cases uh, because this is usually in a lab journal, but instead of it being in a lab journal of a PhD student that is unreachable because he moves to Australia, for example, you now have it centrally available in the tool. Uh, so in trade, these things, uh, these templates, uh, can be provided for a multitude of uh, non-omics assays. And then we have said, like, okay, no, as a user, you can use the templates that are given so that it will become standardized. You cannot make, there, there will be no wild growth of templates. And if there is a template that's not sufficient for you, we can adjust it, make some slight changes, and then to, we will also share this template. So having data harmonization by control of the templates. Uh, so this is basically uh, what it looks like in the tool version one. In version two, it will be uh, even better. What you can see for which subjects and for which markers you measured, uh, the value and the ratio, so basically the unit behind it. 
Um, that was this is for example the the pre-processed data. You want to get the data to Transmart, so then it's important that you also have the processed values uh, available. In Transmart, it's usually a yes/no situation for the non-AMEX data. Yes, you have copy number call, or no, you have uh, no uh, uh, not a copy number call. So you can see here there are extra features then with values from okay in the unit it's described as zero is normal and a one is for instance a gain. Uh, this data can be exported pretty easily from the phenotype database. You can select for yourself like I want to have everything that's in the tool including all the measurements or you select no it's supposed to go to Transmart so now I only select those ones that contain the processed copy number data you get an export file and you can hand this over to the data curators which in our case are uh, people from the Hive and then they now easily have a script that can upload the data into Transmart and to the right place of the tree. So that is the Sana use case that was used to investigate data formats and what it all looked like. Uh, some of you may have seen the post by Jeroen Goos on the tissue microarrays or listened to the presentation of Raymond this morning that he showed clinical data of one of the TMA studies, is an open clinica. The images of the TMA data are uploaded to TEPIS and the data is available in Phenotype database. So continuing on that, uh, Jeroen has created a study before he left to describe his uh, data. And as stated, his data is available in Open Clinica. Please do not copy all the fields. Uh, users can always trace back from Transmart any extra information that they would know. This is actually a file from another PhD student that was left behind with subjects with multiple identifiers and then uh, something that was not curated and then you have to guess what are the items and eventually you think you know it but you don't know it. And then the next thing are the numbers. And then you think, okay, a one for ARCA means it's overexpression if it's in the dichotomized column. A zero is not low expression. Then you come to TP53 and you think, hey, hey, the same principle applies. Ask the data owner, it wasn't the case. So what was really lacking here was the metadata. What do the numbers mean? Especially because every researcher right now have different uh, manners of storing this data. So that's why Phenotype Database is also handy. Uh, Jeroen looked at what was measured and he tried to reach standardization looking at different uh, TMA studies that they had. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's a long name like ORCA and it was measured on normal colon and it was uh, measured on the core and what, what, what he measured. You can trace it back and you can view everything that he did. What was the location that he scored? How did he make his cutoff? What were the antibodies? What was positive control? It's all available now. And this is really nice to see for us. So this is, <coughs> for his subject, the process data is available. And you can see in the units right now behind every sample uh, what it means. This will move up in the newer version. And this column especially of his, is of interest because this was reported in the article. So then it was stated, I want to have this data available in Transmart cannot be done with one push of the button, you still need to know a little bit on how you want the data in there. So basically it is low dimensional data in, uh, low dimensional data in Transmart uh, and it can be easily uploaded. The data owner has now indicated these are my processed files, please upload them to Transmart because I want to integrate them with other data files. Uh, and you do need to take in mind that the data needs to be curated still. We do not want to see a one or a zero in Transmart, we want to see no to low expression versus high expression, but this is available using the feature information. One thing that was relatively new still for us is that you can now add metadata to the items in Transmart, um, so, so you can provide more information. This is the actual study of Jeroen as it is present in Transmart right now, and, and these are the proteins that he measured with the called data. He said like, this is how I want to analyze my data, I want to have it end up in Transmart this way. And what's really nice, I can right mouse click on the, this folder, but also on this folder, and then I see, oh, ARCA was measured, and it was measured on colorectal cancer, liver metastasis. If I click on that URL and I have access to both Phenotype Database and the study that Jeroen has to grant me access for, or a data owner, then I can click it and go directly to the assay, and then I know, oh, the feature or the marker is called this 
if I click on this link, and then you can see everything in context with each other. You have the metadata all surrounding it. Uh, so this is really nice, and as was stated also now, we want to fill more, we want to fill the tool with more data because now we can uh, use it and explore the data. Uh, so the clinical data will be extended so that we can make nice survival curves because there is progression-free survival available, overall survival status. Uh, the non-omics in this case is the TMA data. Other studies have other data, and we are in the process of getting it into Transmart. Uh, and also, of course, high throughput molecular profiling data. And then, indeed, uh, you can do survival analysis, fissure exact tests, compare your cohorts, and uh, from that, users will use it, become enthusiastic, and will want more with the data. So, uh, this is basically showing you from Finitab database, you can easily get the data into Transmart, but once you are in Transmart, you can easily link back to the original source in Finitab database. <coughs> And with that, I actually would like to conclude this presentation. And thanks you, thank you for your attention. If you have questions, don't hesitate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carl. So, if you have questions, yeah. Um, awesome, beautiful. Thank you. Um, uh, one question. So, I understand um, how you um, uploaded basically the cell. Um, testing, uh, assay testing information in Transmart, that's all cool. The last slide that you showed was the survival plots, yes, this one. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not 100% clear how you're integrating clinical data with the cell. Um, no, 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 this is not, the, from, from, from the moment it was a TMA study, it was actually the study from Jeroen Goos that, that you see. So the, the, the cell and use case opened the data, like how do I, what, what, what are the critical bugs, what are the KVATs, what are the formats, and then the tissue micro study from Gauss was an actual first use case. So the tissue comes from patients? It comes from patients. So patients have survival data? Yeah. Okay, all right, now I get it. Thank yeah, you. Do. Any other question? Um, can you comment maybe on the possibilities to continue on uh, data standardization? Uh, well, for the data standardization, Yildao, uh, for her studies, is already uh, making her templates available for sharing. So you can go to dbnp.org, have a look at the templates if they're sufficient to describe your study, for instance. And because she uses drop downs or predefined template fields, you make standardization possible in that way. And for the clinical part, basically, we have to report minimal information guidelines so we can repeat the information. Uh, in a sandbox environment that we have in Trade, we provide users the opportunity to play around. How does the tool work? Oh, I want to make a template. Oh, template is available already. Nice, I can adjust it. And then when they go to the production environment that will be open for sharing with everyone, um, <laughs> they will really have to go through top desk and make requests. And then it's either yes, we will make this template for you, and otherwise it will be like, but the template is already available, like you are really supposed to use this template, and if there is a field missing for you, we can add a field possibly if it is suitable. Uh, so that's how we want to push forward the standardization, actually. And also, due to training, just give trainings, tell them like, okay, this is how we do it, and we want to pass on the knowledge. That's how we want to do it. Thank you. Okay.